the lover of wilderness, Alaska is certainly one of the most stunning places in the world. In this pristine, clean environment, it's perhaps unexpected to find that the effects of climate change are stronger here than almost anywhere else on Earth, and with potentially severe consequences for the planet. We will meet a scientist from Alaska who will tell us more about this. But he will also bring us a message of optimism for the future in what he believes is a working formula for sustainability, Earth stewardship. The ancient soils of Arctic permafrost hold the organic remains of leaves, grass and animals that died thousands of years ago during the Ice Age. All that carbon has been safely bound in frozen Earth until now. Permafrost is right on the cusp of disappearing. The land collapses. Then the water collects in those places. That gathers more heat and it melts the ice even more quickly. There's a vast quantity of carbon stored in permafrost. Right now it's believed to be about twice as much as humans have put into the atmosphere since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And that's what we're trying to study here right now. We're warming the permafrost. We've pushed the condition to what it might be like in about 50 to 100 years into the future. So this site where it's warmed is a source of atmospheric carbon now. Arctic permafrost has been diminishing for many centuries. Thawing started before humans went into the industrial age. The problem now is the speed of it, caused by our greenhouse gas emissions. No one knows for sure how fast the process is, but effects could be dramatic. Releasing only a part of this frozen carbon would overwhelm decades of emissions from our vehicles, power plants, ships and airplanes. This has been known for some time, but research from one of Terry Chapin's former students, Professor Katie Walter Anthony, reveals a new phenomena, abrupt thawing. Okay, Katie, what, what are we seeing here? What you can see coming out of the water are bubbles, and those bubbles are almost pure methane. Methane's a greenhouse gas, so when the bubbles pop at the lake surface, they're putting methane into the atmosphere. At the beginning of a bad weather event, when the pressure falls, you come out in the lake and the whole lake is bubbling, really? yes. Katie Walter Anthony has for two decades been measuring the methane coming from newly formed Arctic lakes called thermokarst. Her recently published study suggests that abrupt thaw could nearly triple the greenhouse gas emissions expected from permafrost. Methane is also highly flammable. This is even more visible in wintertime when large amounts of gas is kept under the ice. Our environment is really controlled by the presence or absence of permafrost. So if we lose the permafrost, then the whole ecosystem changes. And since Alaska and the Arctic are so sensitive to temperature, it's also the place where processes are going to be most strongly affected. It's already happening. So much of Alaska's famed wilderness is burning tonight. 85 fires scorching that state. Nearly 30 homes have burned. Let's get out of here. The interior portion of the state of Alaska has burned and burned a lot. The smoke impacts from these fires have really become significant. We've seen the boreal forest switch from a carbon sink to a carbon source. Wildfire is part of the natural forest life cycle in Alaska. But as with thawing permafrost, the problem is the speed of change. The fires have become more frequent and they burn more severely. And all of those things have increased because the temperatures are so much warmer and because the climate is so much drier. In order to do something about climate change and other threats to life on the planet, Terry Chapin has developed a concept called Earth Stewardship. It's a set of principles on ecology and ethics. The connections between people and nature are the foundation of stewardship and the local places that people know well are the ones they care about. I know you've been involved in uh, projects with indigenous people here in Alaska for many years. Why, why is that? They're one of the most inspirational examples I can think of of stewardship. I'd like to take you to the village of Igiagik. It's one of the most inspirational examples I know. 
Indigenous people have a wonderful tradition and history of relating to the land because they absolutely depend on it for survival. There's an ethic of respect that has been lost to some degree in Western society. Being able to live this lifestyle that we have has really contributed to our success. And then in addition, we keep our people and our values at the center of everything that we do here, the way we've always lived here. This village is probably my greatest inspiration of the way stewardship can play out at local scales. It's a community that faces huge challenges. It's off the electricity grid, it's off the road system. It's very expensive to live here. It's a tough place to live. And yet everyone here is really focused on making this a sustainable community over the long term. It's an inspiration for the future. Previously, some fresh food needed to be flown into the village. Now the villagers have built greenhouses to become more self-sufficient. People are happy. They're buying local produce and it's the healthiest food for us. It complements our subsistence way of life, so it just makes sense. Apart from fresh vegetables, they also get eggs, but they need to protect the area. Yes. <laughs> well, in our case, the greenhouse is like on a bare highway of some sort. And so it, the bears just love to go to the greenhouse. We had an electric fence around it, but they do need to be protected. <laughs> The village is off-grid, dependent on expensive fuel to power the diesel generators. This is about to change with the installment of one of the world's first full-scale river generators. Compared to traditional hydropower, this does not destroy the living conditions for fish in the river. Any development has to be compatible with our subsistence way of life. We're not trading one resource for another. We would never, and salmon are central, so we keep them first. We live out here for this connection to the land that we have, and so that has to be preserved. Terry Chapin believes grassroots movements can trigger lifestyle changes, reduce the ecological footprint, and create more environmentally friendly companies and governments. So in this way, ideas that begin with individuals and households spread to communities, spread to nations, and then the international conversations pick up these ideas and these themes and carry them out to global levels. Ribgen power system. The difficulties that science has today is not that the scientific facts are uncertain, but that we have difficulty communicating this clearly to the public. And stewardship means almost the same thing to the scientist, to the manager, and to the general public. Terry Chapin's early research focused on plants and how they adapted to changing conditions in the north. His scope expanded over time as he realized that understanding one part of an ecosystem requires understanding it holistically. This is one of the reasons I think that stewardship is so important. It's a chance to reshape the future path that humanity has. We have no choice. We must take this path. It's only been 70 years since we had earth-shattering effects on the climate. It's not too late to fix those problems. I love how optimistic he is. Terry is a brilliant scientist and a brilliant person, and sometimes I feel sorry because it always seems like his thinking is about 10 years ahead of the rest of us. I learned a lot from him scientifically, but I learned even more. I'm going to get <laughs> teary. I learned even more from his character. He's one of the humblest people I know. He was always the person who would take the back seat, be the last in line to take food, doing whatever the hard job was to be done. So even though he was the leader, he was an example of how a leader should also be a servant. You may even see him in a pizza hut playing Irish music. I also really enjoy taking my fiddle with me when I go out to do field work. It's a chance to just enjoy life, relax, and communicate with nature as well as with friends and he would wake us up every morning with his fiddle outside of our tents, and <laughs> that was beautiful. That's just Terry. <laughs>